Hi, everyone. I am Dr. Nisi Hamilton, and I survived human trafficking. Really think about what's the life expectancy of a survivor after they've been trafficked. Statistics show that only 1% of survivors make it out, and I'm a part of that 1%. Trafficking for me started when I aged out of foster care at 14 years old, and that did something to me. All the restraints, parental controls, everything that you would use as a guide as a child was violated. My mother was on drugs all of her life. I had never met my father. My grandmother had died of breast cancer nine months after I was returned home. A part of me experiencing human trafficking has everything to do with adultification. The healthiest way to remember human trafficking is the buyer, the seller, the slave. You know, there's always the recruitment, the exploitation, and then there's the fraud. I was raped by a neighbor. Um, my grandmother at that time thought that it was too much for her to bear. And I went to a uh, shelter in Houston, Texas called CRC, Chimney Rock Center. And I lived there for quite some time. And because I wasn't allowed to go back home and really just go through that process, cause you know, my rapist was on trial. I just don't think that my family was really ready to deal with something that big. I think it was too big for them just to manage the conflict of it. And so I wasn't allowed to go back home. And what eventually happened was because I stayed at the shelter for too long, I ended up in foster care. You know, I just remember thinking, you know, I'm ready to go back home. You know, can I go back home? Maybe if I do my best in foster care, I'll be seen as a good child. For instance, if you're in foster care, they have options of foster to adopt. And foster to adopt will allow you to adopt, you know, a relative, but the state will pay you. Okay, because I was already 14 in the state of Texas, uh, the laws changed a lot in the state of Texas. So in the, in the family code at 14 years old, you are allowed to say which parent you want to live with. But because I was in a foster to adopt status, there was no option to foster. There was no option to adopt. Because I'm 14, I'm allowed to make a say-so, but I'm also allowed to ask for emancipation. Now, I never asked for emancipation. Emancipation was offered to me by the state because I had no, pa no parents. I had no family. I, I was a ward of the state. The state obviously knew the conditions of my grandmother and I was the one that was left out and I had no idea. You know, I'm 14, I choose not to be emancipated. I'm home for a couple months, my grandma passes away and I'm homeless. And so here is an expression of a vulnerability that now I have to address. Well, I miss school. So the only time I can eat is when I'm at school, so I'm determined to stay in school. But as I am couch surfing, staying with different friends, you know, um, just trying to make the best situation out of a bad situation, all I keep hearing is, if I stay here too long, or if I'm here this long, or if I'm here X amount of time, then I might get pregnant. So while they're telling me, hey, you can't stay here too long because you might get pregnant. As a child, I interpreted, hey, maybe if I get pregnant, I can stay somewhere a little longer because I think that pregnancy is going to cure my homelessness. And it was the worst decision that I could have ever made in my entire life. I had my baby and everything was going great until I realized I didn't have a system for daycare. I knew I wasn't gonna abandon my kid like my family had abandoned me. So I took my baby to school with me in a purse and I sat in the back of a classroom. My school counselor actually suggested that I go ahead and unenroll out of school and get a GED, which was totally illegal because technically <laughs> I wasn't 18. Literally 20 days after I have my baby and all of this is going on, the state of Texas sues me for being homeless with a baby.
as I'm, you know, caught in this system and I'm being sued about my state, the judge says that I have three requirements and those three requirements was to get a GED, have a bank account, put money on it. He doesn't care where the money's coming from, just put the money in there. And to make sure I have stable housing. Now, by this time, I'm 16 years old. And I don't have an attorney, by the way. So I don't have anybody consulting with me to tell me what are my options and what is the best route. I ran into this friend of mine who was who was already working in a strip club and she was living with her boyfriend at the time. And she goes, well, I work at a strip club and I'm like, well, doing what? And she was like, oh, don't worry. I'm just waitressing. It's not a big deal. I'm just serving drinks. And I use her ID to work in a strip club. And I'm making about $75 a day at this point. And as time goes on, maybe about like two, two months or so, two or three months goes on where I can trust the situation. I get home one day and the boyfriend tells me, you can't have your kid back unless you pay me $200 a day. There's another pimp inside the club that hears what's going on. And the girls that are already being pimped out by the guy that's inside the club go and tell the new pimp what's happening with me. They asked me to show him who was the guy that was doing all of these, you know, weird things to me. And I did. He's there to defend my honor. He's there to protect me. So he's my boyfriend. I can move my kid out of the one guy's house and move it into his house. At least I thought life was peaceful. And that was something that I was willing to hold on to. That was something I was really to fight for. I'm living in a house with this guy, but this guy has other women living in the house too. So I'm in a hell. So he tells me one day, hey, get dressed, get pretty. I'm gonna go somewhere. I'm thinking we're going out to dinner. And he drives me to a hotel on the north side of Houston. We pull up to the hotel, he gives me the key card pulls out a gun. He tells me what room to go into. And then he says, if you don't come out with my money, it's going to cost you your life. Now, back in the early 2000s, sex trafficking was different. If you were being trafficked and, you know, there was a condom involved, you made less money. If there was no condom, you made more money. So the court case is going on and I'm being trafficked with no condom, I get pregnant by a John. I remember I, I worked in the store inside of Greens Point Mall in Houston, Texas. It sold lingerie and different um, like body wear for strippers. The only interest to the mall, if you get there too early, was where the Army, the Navy, the Marines and the Air Force was. All the young people were out running and doing the exercises and really just doing like boot camp training and things like that. And I thought it was so cool. Uh, there was a Navy recruiter who would always talk to me every morning. I just was like, oh my God, here he comes again, you know. <laughs> he wants to recruit me in the military. I'm just like, I don't qualify, dude. Like, go away already. You know what I mean? Like, like Navy recruiters are worse than that dude that's in the Everest commercial who is like, come on, get off the couch. You can do it. You sitting at home. You ain't doing nothing. It was very interesting. This Navy recruiter asked me, how am I doing? How you doing turned into me telling him everything about how I was doing. He said, look, I can't do nothing but recruit you in the military and I know you feel like you don't qualify, but if you take this test and if you are determined, I promise you, I'm gonna get you in so you can have a better life for your kids. And I took the practice ASVAP and I think I made like a 30 on it or something like that. So he takes me to 701 MEPS in Houston, Texas, which is a military base. And so 2006, um, I go in to take this test. I feel terrible because I'm in this room. I'm the only black person. I have red hair right here. I have an eye piercing. I have a tongue piercing. I have a libre. My boobs are pierced. Everything below my belly button is pierced, right? Like include my hoo-ha and my yoo-hoo, like all of that. And as you can imagine, I am scared to death. 
it was like being in the twilight zone. Everything was so white and khaki. And then here I come just looking like a social butterfly. Like, hi. You know, could you imagine somebody coming straight out the strip club? Like, hi. You know, party over here. And it's the military. So you guys, I'm in there. And it's time for me to take my test. And then they call me into the back and they go, you can't take your test. And I go, why not? And they say, well, you don't look like the other kids that are there to take the test. So I start boohoo crying because they just validated everything I said about myself that I didn't qualify. I remember they they called my recruiter. Um, his name is Reese, and we still talk today. And Reese was pissed. Why can't she take it? She can take it. Um, he said, "Well, she's out of." She's out of compliance because of her hair. Now, mind you, I'm not even in the military yet. I'm trying to get in the military. My hair is out of compliance. Not the piercings, my hair. So I know there was some lies up in now, okay? But I ain't doing no tripping today because I, we, you know, we did our thing. So I'm in there and they give me this plastic bag and they're like, cover it up. And Reese was like, you've been ride or die for everything in your life. The one time you need to be ride or die is to take this test in this military installation looking like Boo Boo the Fool. I mean, straight up clown. And you better take that test. So as soon as I was done, I mean, I was like Boo Hoo crying in the bathroom. I'm like, oh my God, did I pass it? Oh my God. And so I made a 54 and got into the military. They gave me two options. They was like, look, Either you going to chip paint and clean ship for your time in the military, or you could go be a military police officer. And all I kept thinking about is, oh my God, somebody's going to put a gun in my hand. I'm going to be fucking badass. I can't believe it. I'm about to get in. So I start signing contracts immediately. Everything is happening so fast. So I know you guys were like, oh my God, she went to the Navy. Did she have an awesome military life? And really it wasn't that quite simple because I had been trafficked at such a young age and I was getting ready to go into the military. My trafficker's parents um, decided that his best option at that particular point was to go ahead and marry me. In this case, in the state of Texas, you are not allowed to incriminate your husband because it's against the law. So actually, Everything he had done to me as a minor was moot because he had married me. I married him because I was more concerned that if I had died in war, who was I going to leave my children to? His parents told me that I would have special attention for my children, such as having someone to leave them to, the mere fact that they could end up in foster care, which had not served me, or that the state could take them, which had not served me. It's totally pissed me off. Those relationships were already ruined. I thought it'd be best that, you know, their fighting chance would have been with my trafficker opposed to being with the state. But I ended up having another kid. Today, I have seven children with number eight on the way. And two of my children come from my sex trafficking experience. What I've been able to do with my military experience is go to college. I went to school and I got a bachelor's in science and technical management with a minor in criminal justice. Then I got an MBA in accounting because, you know, if you if you're getting that money, you know what I mean? In the strip club, you're getting the bands, you know what I mean? And it's raining on you. You got to be an accountant, honey. You got to have that knowledge. And then I stayed in school because I was excited about learning that I got another MBA in human resource management. Well, you know, if I was sleeping with Tim on Monday, then John on Tuesday, and Frank on Wednesday, then this is human resources. <laughs> so as you can imagine, I was trying at that time to turn the worst things that had happened to me into the best things that had happened to me. I was trying to turn it into a resume. In 2013, the same trafficker decided to sue me um, so that he could get his daughter. And he wanted X amount of dollars in child support. He wanted his cash cow back. So in 2013, I ended up losing my kids. And the same man who was trafficking me, I ended up having to pay them child support. So by the time 2015 came, 
I've gone two years without my children. At that particular time, I had five kids already. One of my kids is in the same situation I was in that fostered to adopt, but he's not 14, so he can't make that decision. We end up having an emergency hearing, and I had a judge ask a very valuable question. Why wasn't the kids with mom? And so here it is, the first time somebody says she needs an attorney. And I finally get an attorney. Her name was Julie Ketterman. And I remember telling her my story. And she said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hire you. I said, hire me? Hire me to do what? She was like, because you need a job. And she ended up making me her paralegal. And then I ended up creating the defenses to get all of my kids back. And not only that, I was able to tell my story in court. In 2014, all the fathers were invited to court to take a DNA test. And because they did DNA tests without attorneys, it became an automatic admission of guilt. And this was the one time in my life, I'm thinking to myself, finally, justice, <laughs> somebody believes me. I was a comedian and my jokes were Horrible. Oh my God. They used to call me nasty Nisi. I was I was so just like explicit with everything. People thought it was so hilarious. And I'm like, this shit ain't funny. Like, I don't see how y'all see this as funny. This is like real life stories for me. I was honored in Atlanta with an honorary doctor's degree in global humanitarianism, which I am super excited about because I started a 501c3, which started out as a for-profit, a survivor's voice of victory, but now it's Nisi's network where we started to assist girls in different countries. You know, you just see so much and you want to do so much, but you do what you can, where you can. And then um, with A Survivor's Voice, we've been able to get just different partnerships with people like Procter & Gamble, which I'm super excited about, as well as with um, different churches. We have been able to gather over $1 million in resources and give it out to the community to prevent adultification. And for the last three years, I am married, darling to my awesome chef husband, who is amazing. So now it's like, I ain't even got to cook no more. I'm like, praise God. I love my husband and he's uh, an executive chef over at Live Nation. And so we have an awesome big family because there's like 10 of us, I think almost. Yeah, with the baby. My kids are awesome. They know everything. Um, I don't hide anything from them. All right, guys, I hope you all enjoyed the Nisi Hamilton story, right? If you like my story, you can always leave a comment below. I love you.